Hey, my name is Rami Soon, and I'm a senior software engineer at Docker. I've been working in the software industry for over 10 years. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about software development and life and open source here at Docker. This video will be helpful for junior devs and also for younger people that might be curious or interested about getting into the software industry. So I first got into programming in my junior year of high school about grade 11. And then what really kind of sparked it for me was during my second term in my first year in university, I went to the Canadian Undergraduate Software Engineering Conference, QSEC, and then there I tended to talk about subversion and I learned about version control, which really blew my mind because this whole time I've been writing Java on Notepad actually. So learning about version control and how you monitor and see these changes and merge with your, you know, your colleagues' works was really something. So for myself, really, they were all key stops in its own way. Certainly at IBM, I've worked at IBM the longest for about five years, and that's where I really got myself started in open source. My second key stop I would say is at Click, um, where I got exposed to incident management and I was also given an opportunity to act as a manager for about eight people while our regular manager was on maternity leave. So that was a great experience also. So in terms of experience working in the cloud, I'll say one of the most important things during an incident is to try to parallelize. So what I mean is that during one of our incidents, we had one engineer working on the backend fix. And then I asked another engineer to start setting up a staging environment so that once this individual was completed with the fix, we would be able to quickly test it in our staging environment. During an incident, every second counts. So try to do as many different things as you can that you know that reasonably can be parallelized so that you can reduce the time of the outage. Okay, so in terms of a big company versus a startup, certainly you know at a bigger company, there will be more red tape as they call it. In my experience, I was fortunate enough to not experience too much of that, but I did kind of understand the additional like legality or you know additional checks that you have to do before you deliver something or get approvals and so on. I will say though that for some of our younger viewers that might be watching this right now, if you're an intern that just completed a an internship at one company and now another year or two is rolled over and you're looking for an internship again, and even if you've established a great relationship with your first company, I strongly recommend that you try working at a different company, you know, if possible, while you're young is the best chance to try different things. So if you can have an internship going at a big company and a small company and different places, you can really learn a lot. So make sure you try different things while you're young. So I don't remember exactly how I got into open source per se, but I do know that in 2005, during my first year in university, I started using Gen2 Linux. And then in April of that time, I got kind of involved in the Java GNOME project and I heard about a kind of a small gathering of contributors in Toronto. So I took public transit maybe I think maybe 90 minutes or two hours I took from my from my campus all the way to downtown Toronto and I visited the Red Hat office in Toronto and met with other people so that was a really great experience and then in 2006 I started working on Eclipse you know contributing or answering just answering questions and so on on IRC and so on and then in 2009 I was offered a job from IBM to work for them because of my background and experience in Eclipse so that was really lucky for me to be able to you know work on open source and then get a job after university right with the Eclipse team. So that was fantastic. So for myself at the time, I was definitely not a heavy Docker user by any means. I was actually teaching English in Japan at the time. So I was just looking at, you know, catching up on tech news here and there once in a while. And I heard about Docker and also read about the language server protocol. So that's when I thought, hey, you know, this Docker technology is really cool, blowing my mind over here and it's a single file. How hard could it be to parse this single file and you know provide these editing features like code completion and you know document highlighting and so on so that's how the project got started and yeah after some internal testing and you know a little here and there i said hey let's let's push this out to github and i published it in june of 2017 and now it's being used by you know your old original terminal editors like vim and emacs and so on all the way to newer editors like zed so there are two features that were difficult to implement and support. The first one being semantic highlighting to add a better improved syntax highlighting beyond what a TextMate syntax could provide. And then the second one was when Docker build added here document support. Then I had to update the parser to handle those here documents. Now that I'm here at Docker, I'm able to talk to the teams and make sure they're considering the editing experience also when they're implementing new features. In terms of my day to day, my first thing would be to open up Slack to see if I have any unread messages that I need to address. And then I'll check Google Calendar to see if I've got any meetings I should be aware of for today. And then I'll check GitHub to see if there are any issues or community questions. And then once I've kind of gone through that, I'll go take a look at our sprint board and see what's on deck for the sprint and what I still need to do. And then I'll start hacking away on code. So I'm very proud of adding the bacon compose support into the Docker language server. 
We've already gotten some issues and community questions about the bake support. So it's good to see that people are already using the language server. And then in terms of Compose support, the community actually asked me about it back in 2019. You know, it's a long time now, but I'm glad that I'm now able to offer people Compose support through the Docker language server. So I think LSPs will continue to evolve. You know, we got code lens and inlay hints in the past 10 to 15 years. So I think with generative AI, it's going to necessitate the creation of new and original UX patterns that we're going to want to bring into the language server protocol specification. For users though, I think the lines will be a little blurry as to what is from the LSP and what's from the editor natively or what the generative AI is doing here. I think that's okay for the user, you know, they don't need to know where a feature is coming from. They just want to write great software, right? So I think, yeah, I think the lines will blur, but from a user point of view, everything should be seamless. So I still see a lot of people not using multi-stage builds. If you do a search online, you still see a lot of sample or tutorial Docker files that don't use multi-stage builds. Multi-stage builds keep your dependencies secure and everything. You know, you don't have your source code in your image either. You only have the resulting binary. So I think everyone should be using multi-stage builds. I'm usually listening to Japanese music myself. I've been listening to a lot of Bump of Chicken in the last year. And yes, that, that is the name of the band, Bump of Chicken. If you've never heard of it, you probably haven't. Please check them out. They're, they're amazing. One, software engineering is more than just writing code. People skills are very important. Two, don't spend too much time spinning wheels, getting stuck on a problem. If you spent half an hour, an hour on it, you know, reach out to a senior dev, your tech lead and see if you've maybe missed something obvious and they'll be able to redirect you back on the right path. Three, if you have any questions or, you know, not sure about stuff with the company and so on, reach out to your manager. They're there to help you. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, be sure to like this video and subscribe. We'll be sharing even more ways to showcase Docker's exciting features on our upcoming videos.